It's time to ignite your soul and unlock your full potential. Join us on Beneath the Helmet, the podcast exploring firefighters' health and wellness. Hosted by retired fire chief Arjuna George, our podcast is the perfect place to start your journey towards becoming the best version of yourself. So come on, let's join the conversation and find out what sets your soul on fire. All right, fellow BTH community, welcome to this episode with an amazing new guest. Today, I get the privilege to sit down with Ali Rothrock, an author, TEDx speaker, firefighter, and just a true leader in our world, but in the mental health community as well. Uh, Ali joined the fire service when she was 16 years old, uh, went through several challenges pretty early on in her career that kind of formed where she is today. The amount of challenges that she went through in the first few years led to a, a further diagnosis of PTSD uh, in 2012. So through all this tragedy, through all this hurt and pain, she's turned around and made some amazing businesses, wrote some amazing books that will really help uh, all people, not just first responders, but anyone dealing with stress, stress and trauma. She's using her experience now to share of how we can take better care of ourselves and watch out for our brothers and sisters. So in the show notes, there'll also be all her website, her communications, how to reach out to her, uh, as well as links to her, both her books and also her TEDx talk as well. So sit back, relax, enjoy the show, make sure you have a pen and paper you want to take some notes for this one for sure. Before we get started, just want to connect with our BTH community. I appreciate uh, last week, this was the end of May 2023. Uh, we reached over 500 plays on, uh, on Spotify. So thank you so much for the support there. Uh, and if you can support the BTH community even further, uh, like and subscribe, share the message, share the podcast on social media, uh, get that out there in the hands of those people that need it. The more people that like and subscribe, download, play, the farther our reach is going to be across the world. And uh, all we can do is continue this conversation about the mind, body, and soul. The Beneath the Helmet show is sponsored by Silver Arrow Coaching Consulting. We're burnout and resilience coaching for high performers, those who are susceptible to, to burnout and high levels of stress and trauma. And that is definitely the first responder and firefighter community. You can connect to Silver Arrow Coaching Consulting at www.silverarrowco.com. All right, so sit back, relax, enjoy the show. And uh, until next time, stay well. All right, Allie Rothrock, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I'm so happy to be here. You have been an inspiration to myself over the years. I've definitely watched your story unfold, and I really think you're a very powerful person. And thank you. Yeah, and you have a very oh, that means so much. Very important message to share. So very happy to have you on the show today. Thanks. I'm honored. That's awesome, Ellie. Paint us a picture about where you came from and how you ended up being here today. Sure. So I grew up in. Pennsylvania in America. So for those who aren't really familiar with the state, we have Philadelphia, we have Pittsburgh. Those are our east and west. And I'm smack. I grew up smack in the middle in Center County, right in the middle of the state. So pretty normal average of growing up. Mom, dad, younger sibling, dog, really safe, secure childhood. And I thought I wanted to be Everything from a figure skater to a marine biologist to a tornado chaser to a singer, everything under the sun. But I was an ice skater for a long time until I randomly found firefighting. And no one was more surprised than I that it turned out firefighting was what I feel, felt and feel that I was put on this earth to do. I found firefighting in 11th grade in high school. So I was 16. And really, the rest is a long storied history from there, but that's where it all started. I, I found firefighting when I was 16. And you're still firefighting? Yes. yes. My husband's in the Air Force. We move often and moves are either last minute or you're ready to move and then it doesn't happen. So it's hard to, there's instability with where we live right now. Just we have a couple moves coming up, but we know where we will land. And once we land there, I'm very excited to, to pick it all back up. But everything is still active. I'm very involved in the community and just doing what I can while I'm all over the place. So what was your experience being a firefighter like? What were some of the highlights and some of the low points? Sure. So I 
just literally randomly stumbled upon firefighting. No one in my family does it. I have an uncle who retired as a 911 dispatch supervisor. So I was aware of emergencies and the process that happens when you call 911 from hearing stories from him growing up. But I remember the summer before I found firefighting, there was a TV show called Third Watch. And it was like a drama, like the firefighting ones are on TV now. No, as firefighters, like we can't stand to watch them. But before I really knew what the emergency services were, I was obsessed with this TV show. I don't even think it was still airing at that time. I think I just watched all the DVDs and it's the emergency services in New York City. So it's fire, EMS, it's law enforcement. And I was just absolutely captivated and started to look back at my life and things that really interested me, things that excited me, things that made me feel passionate, like I was helping people. And they all sort of sort of maybe fit in, ah, maybe I'm supposed to be a firefighter. Maybe I want to try that. And one of our local volunteer assistant chiefs was a member of the church that I went to. And I cornered him one day after church and asked, so what's the firefighter about? What's that like? How does one see if they want to do that? And conveniently that day, it was October and here in America, October might be national or international, but it's fire prevention week. So mm -hmm. firehouses have open houses and come get a smoke detector and get a fire helmet and ride fire trucks. And that was that day that I asked him. And so he said, come over. It was across the street. And I walked over there with my parents and my sibling. And that was the day that what I had been looking for, my purpose, and I were like, and now we're here. And it's firefighting. That's what I was supposed to do. And I don't think they're allowed to do this anymore. But back then, you know, years ago, they had built a little shed, like very shed is a loose term, but it had walls and a roof and mm -hmm. they put some hay inside and members of the community could put gear on and see, take a little hose line inside and see what it felt like. And so I was in line. I was the only girl. And uh, my parents were like, what are we doing? <laughs> Can we talk about this? It was just completely out of the blue. And I did that and I have a bunch of pictures of me doing that, which is really cool to watch like the expression on my face and how just focused and excited and determined I was. The gear was so big. It was, if you can think back to the first time putting on fire gear, what it felt like to just stand, let alone walk, run, crawl, reach, lift, all those things. So I was doing all that for the first time in gear that did not fit. But I went inside with one of the assistant chiefs and put out this little hay bale that was on fire and it was just like, click, mm. that's it. So I bug. turned to the, that's right, the fire <laughs> bug was alive and well in me. And so I went to the fire chief and he gave me an application to join the fire company. And at 16, I was going to be restricted in some of the things I could do, no power tools and never going inside a burning building, but there's a lot else that can be done and a lot else that can be learned. So I filled out the application, I submitted it. And that was an interesting day and an interesting moment because knowing what I know now about how that all evolved. I can look back and see moments where what was to come, the beginning signs were there. And so what I mean by that is I remember when I handed in my application to the designated person and I was really excited. And I was like, hi, I'm Allie. I think I want to be a firefighter. And he had this look on his face as if I was doing something in that moment to make him really angry. Mm. And I was just too excited to think too much about it, but I definitely noted it. And so... Looking back, I think that was my first indication of what sort of environment I would find. But that was October. I got voted in. I got a pager and a locker and gear. And I was just the happiest person alive. That was October. And then I didn't get my first call till about a month later. And that call ended up being quite a doozy. I don't know what your first call was for most people. It's nothing really, but at least you got your first one. For mine, it ended up being a fatal car accident involving children. And so I remember everybody pulled this little girl out of her car seat and do CPR on her on the stretcher in the middle of this shutdown highway. It was snowing. I didn't know anything. So all I could do was watch and try to learn. And I remember thinking, I wonder what we're all supposed to do with this. What do you do with this memory? What do we do with this experience that we all just had? This is so tragic. It was right around the holidays, which makes everything just more sad. And I remember just wanting to get back to the firehouse because somebody certainly was going to tell me, here's what we do with experiences like this. But instead, when we got back to the firehouse, I was hanging around again, first call. So I have no idea what's going on. So I'm just I take my gear off because that's what other people are doing. I see sort of groups of people gathering and I started walking around to see what there was to do or to talk about. And I 
heard someone say, good, this will get rid of her. We won't even have to do anything. There's no way I give her a week. And I was just like, I love this a lot already. And even though this was the worst thing I could imagine, and you're not helping me process that at all, it still didn't feel like that attitude was going to be the dominant one. I was just excited and had grown up in environments where I was always encouraged and taught and people were happy to see me. And it wasn't until entering this environment that that really changed. So it was this dichotomy right off the bat of this love that I had for firefighting, which I still have, the deep sense of knowing that I'm in my right place. I'm where I'm supposed to be. But it was immediately, there was this dissonance because the people that I was doing this job with did not at all seem to want me there. And the longer I stayed and the more trained I became, the more dangerous that environment became. It's a pretty powerful get story. get into more, but yes, yeah. It's a pretty powerful story because yeah. it gives me weird feelings when you hear stuff, stuff like that occur. So you yeah. said about 18 years ago, is that what you said? or is this... Yeah, it was 18 years ago. And as I've so much more happened and I started to share my story and the most common thing that I would hear from people was like I can't believe this happens at this day and age is what they would always say and I'm 33 now I was 16 when I started I have spent over half of my life in the emergency services and almost not a day goes by truly that I don't hear a story whether it's in person or sent anonymously or posted on my social media platforms of something like this happening to another woman in the emergency services. I thought that what was happening to me had only ever happened to me. That's what makes this type of trauma so isolating is because not only are you embarrassed that these things are happening to you, you feel like you're the only one because the shame makes you not talk about it. So you don't get to know that you're not alone. So once I started sharing my story after I experienced an attempted gang rape, after I experienced three years of absolute hell trauma in this firehouse, being told that it was my fault, being told not to say anything, being threatened in a variety of different ways after I survived, was finally willing to talk to a therapist about how bad my mental health was before I knew what trauma was, before I knew anything like that. I just knew that I wasn't okay. And so in 2012, I got a post-traumatic stress disorder diagnosis, which truly saved my life and put me on the trajectory that I'm on now. But going through it, I just thought I was just an island. I just felt like I had no one that I could talk to. I did. But again, the shame of experiencing things like that of firefighters who you want to trust and think you can trust saying, we'll teach you that, we'll train you, we'll answer your firefighting related question if you xyz sexual proposition that's the only way we'll train you as a 16 year old what the hell are you supposed to do with that all i could figure to do was keep showing up keep being as good as i can be keep learning keep training and maybe someday they will finally believe me that i am here for the right reasons and that i'm good at this and that just didn't happen the better that i got the more well trained i became it just became more and more dangerous and so that environment had a significant impact on my mental health, but I just didn't know it until many years later. Looking back on it, do you have any regrets of joining at 16? I don't at all. It's, I don't at all. I think I never give this advice to anyone else. I think it's incredibly dismissive and not helpful. It's something that you need to arrive at for yourself. But for me, if I had to go through every single thing that happened to me, a literal decade of trauma to get to where I am now, I would do it again every time. That's powerful. Uh, again, not helpful to say it to someone else. If everything happened for a reason. I don't love that because sometimes things are just hard and you don't always know the reason. For me, the meaning that I made out of those experiences and the ways that I have, whether it's through companies that I've created or talks that I give or education that I provide of going back into the emergency services and trying to fill the gaps that I fell through when I was there, whether that's through teaching people how to correctly report child abuse, talking about how to make work environments, whether that's the emergency services or not, more safe, learning how to be actually resilient to build our stress tolerance as emergency responders. How do we do that? I'm getting my master's degree right now in that very thing. So for me, everything that happened to me, the choices that I made after that 
led me to where I am now. And so I have absolutely no regrets. Fantastic. So how did you become this mental health advocate? What kind of, what was the original spark that kind of made that happen where your paths changed and said, I'm going to, I'm going to take this and tell the world about this situation yeah. that I went through. And so how did that happen? It was really, so I self-published my first book, Where Hope Lives in 2010. So this was before I realized that I had post-traumatic stress disorder. That was before I had really understood that everything that I went through was traumatic. Before I understood any of that, I had a fire science degree. I didn't have my bachelor's degree in psychology yet. So it was just, it was a 21-year-old version of the event. I mean, I had that book and I was traveling with that story, but it really wasn't until 2012 when I got my own post-traumatic stress disorder diagnosis and became so much more educated and so much less stigmatized about what post-traumatic stress disorder is, who has a quote right to it, because I thought I didn't because in my mind, the only people that have PTSD are combat veterans. And until my therapist said, actually, the highest percentage of people living with post-traumatic stress disorder are sexual assault survivors, and that's you. I had never thought of myself that way. I never put those words on what I experienced. And so many people, and I spend a lot of time talking about this with first responders, is we're really scared to go to therapy because we don't want a label. We don't want someone to tell us, you have this, and then what does that mean? But for me, post-traumatic stress disorder provided me this new path forward. It provided me validation for what I had gone through and how much it had impacted me and it immediately brought me out of the feeling that I'd been stuck in, which was I'm on this island alone. All of a sudden, it was like post-traumatic stress disorder. Lots of people have had that. Lots of people have lived through it. And I started seeking out those stories and started to really want a community of other people who had experienced trauma and made it to the other side because every overcoming story is different because we all get there in a different way. And then I started thinking back to my first fire call and how this was before debriefings. This was before crisis counseling. This was before any of that, but there wasn't even an acknowledgement of what we had all seen. And that was my first call. They were firefighters there doing it longer than I'd been alive. How many of those calls had they ran in their career? So I really just started thinking about the validation and the freedom and the how much understanding my own mental health was such a catalyst for positive change for me. I wanted to give that to the first responders that I realized didn't have it. And so I got my bachelor's degree in crisis counseling. I joined a bunch of crisis counseling organizations. I became a behavioral health specialist with the Medical Reserve Corps, certified trauma responder. I really started to dive into that world. And I was speaking constantly with Where Hope Lives. And I developed this sort of one-hour course that I delivered all over the country on just like a one-hour basic mental health awareness for first responders. And it got to the point in 2018 where I simply could not keep up with all of the speaking requests. I can't be in Texas and Alaska at the same time. I can't. <laughs> and it was, I was exhausted. And so I thought, how do I make this accessible 24 seven where I don't have to physically be in front of these people? Sometimes people don't want to come into a room where the sign outside says mental health. They don't want to sit in those seats. So how can we provide them perhaps a little bit more privacy until they're more comfortable being in the community. And so I created a company called On the Job and Off, and we now have a very large suite of courses that have been taken by first responders in every single state, and I think all of the Canadian provinces, on everything from post-traumatic stress to grief to sleep to how to better support your fellow first responders to what happens right after you had a bad call. And so that's really the foundation of how On the Job and Off started was just wanting to provide online education. It's I am the primary instructor for most of the courses. We have subject matter experts, but it's just me as a first responder talking to you as a first responder about your experiences on the job and at home. And I really wanted to encompass the whole responder because we don't just leave work at work. We're told to. It sounds good, but we're not given the tools on how to do that. And so that's why I started on the job at home. And as far as I believe, it's five year anniversary. Is that right? Of the it is. Company? This year is yes. five years. Awesome. Most companies do not make it five years. So I'm proud. I'm yes. proud of us. Thank you. Yes. Very awesome. Yes. Been quite the ride. So in your book, you talk a lot about validating emotions. Expand on that for us. What do you mean by validating emotions and what does that yes. mean to you? 
So in After Trauma, which was my second book that was traditionally published almost exactly a year ago, I was really trying to speak to not just trauma survivors, not just first responders, but really anyone who loved a trauma survivor, loved a first responder, wanted to help a friend or anything like that. And I really feel like so much of mental turmoil, emotional struggles, when we really feel like we're preoccupied with something hard that we've gone through is just really on our mind. I feel like so much energy goes to dismissing what we're feeling and validating what we're feeling, saying garbage like someone always has it worse or harder, this shouldn't bother me, or XYZ happened so long ago, it shouldn't bother me anymore. I call that playing the trauma Olympics. It's garbage. It doesn't help anyone. Someone's always going to have something worse, but what happened to you still matters and is perfectly valid. And both in after trauma and with my work with first responders now, And even when I do crisis debriefings, two hours after a critical incident, we spend time naming what we're feeling, whether that's anger, helpless, sad, scared, whatever. We spend time naming those feelings and in whatever way people are comfortable and then talking about why those feelings are justified. As first responders, I don't think we know we aren't often given spaces to say that we felt helpless or scared, or angry, or frustrated. And sometimes that's really what you need. And when we can do that, I know for me, and when I work with our first responder clients, just giving them a space to feel heard and for and to stop dismissing what they're feeling, that is sometimes like half of the battle to overcoming something. When you just radically accept, this is how I feel, and I'm not going to judge it or question it or dismiss it. This is just how I feel. Okay, now we can take a step forward. And for so much of our society, I think especially when it comes to men, just not encouraged to, to express a lot of feelings or to name feelings necessarily. I, and I write about this in After Trauma where there was a, a line of duty death and I was in station maybe an hour after this firefighter was killed. And There was a firefighter in real close proximity to him when he died. And I was just trying to get a gauge on like, where are you at emotionally? Shock. I can see that's mostly or 90% in shock, but what's the rest of it? And he he said he's never tried to name what he was feeling before. What do you mean? And so we did a lot of work there that was really helpful for him. And so I just think that is such a huge part of the work that we do. And the trauma that first responders see, I think, is just giving us time to have the reactions that we have. And I don't mean like we need to set aside months or years or hours. It's just creating that space to say how we feel about something. Because then, like, if you're angry, we can move. We can take a step from anger. If you felt really helpless, we can take a step from there, too. But if we don't know and we can't name it, that's harder to see where our steps forward can take us. So how can we make that environment in the fire service that's acceptable to that and what language could we use to open that door up for those people to be able to express their emotions and what's going through their minds at the moment any thoughts there of course so many thoughts that if i had the one answer the problem would be solved i think it it's truly a top down but also a bottom up approach i've seen leadership refuse to participate in crisis debriefings or refuse to be in the building when there's a crisis counselor present. Not wanting to be in a certain group because you want them to be able to speak freely is different than refusing to show up or telling people that process is garbage. I've seen leadership do that and it certainly sets us back in terms of participation or people thinking that being there is valid. But conversely, it can be just as simple as coming back from a call and while people are getting their gear off or going back to eating or whatever they were doing before hitting the gym, for a leader, and that could be someone whose title gives them leadership or by someone who just is a natural leader in the group, saying, wow, that sucked. That really sucked. I am i can't wait to give my kids a hug later or I just feel a little bit rattled. I'm just going to step out and call my spouse. Or I felt really hopeless when the dispatch came in because I just thought there's just going to be no way. Just that's it. There's a space. You created it. And maybe no one will respond or maybe someone will say, yeah, I also felt this. There's that space. 
And if you're the leader that tries to create that space and no one responds to you in that moment, it still worked because they now know that the door is open with you. If they did have a feeling later or the next day they wanted to talk about something, they know that you're going to be receptive to that. There's a bridge there instead of what we see so often, which is like a closed door, metaphorically, emotionally, and sometimes literally. And so I think that's so huge. I think it's also important to call out stigmatized language. As first responders, sometimes our jobs require us to be giving medical treatment to people who are maybe very mentally unwell. And there are usually some conversations had about that person afterwards. And I think if you were someone who was maybe struggling or thinking about, hey, maybe I want to talk about my mental health, you're certainly not going to after you hear maybe what some people would say. And I think and education is everything, getting people on the same page of what is stress? How do we talk about it? What is post-traumatic stress? How do we talk about it? What's post-traumatic stress disorder? How do we talk about it? And so at On the Job and Off, I created classes to do all of those things and to get people on the same page just when it comes to education. And one of my favorite things to see is we have a course, like I mentioned, called Had a Bad Call. And it's like a bite-sized course. It's maybe 15 minutes. And I literally created it for what I needed to know right after my first call. So it's a bunch of validation about whatever a bad call is for you. What can we expect from ourselves maybe in the first 24 hours, in the first week, in the first month? How do we know when it's time to maybe talk to someone else? How do we create space for those conversations? One of my favorite things to see is I'll usually get a picture from like the back of a training room and like the course is playing and the seats are full of responders and it's two o'clock in the morning and whoever chief is sending me that picture saying, hey, we ran this garbage call in the middle of the night and like we're all sitting down to watch your course. And I'm like, yes, that's awesome. That's creating that space. I don't have to do it necessarily, but we're providing those tools. That's amazing. Well done. Well done. Thanks. I believe in your book, you also talk about a lot about vulnerability. And I think that's a key subject for responders to be aware of because I think vulnerability and I know for myself, I experienced decades of being guarded and now being vulnerable is such a freeing feeling, being open, honest, my authentic self, so freeing. It's like a huge weight yes. off my shoulder. So what would you think about being vulnerable in the fire service and how can that be good or bad maybe? I think one of the things that we can do such a better job on in the emergency services is we're good-ish at teaching people how to react and respond emotionally, like in the moment when you are on scene, something horrible is happening and you just have to do your job. In that moment, there's not necessarily room for the feelings that you might be feeling. And we've all had that where you're, something horrible is happening and your faraway brain is like, wow, I don't want to be seeing this. I don't want to be hearing this. This is horrible, but I have a job to do. And so in those moments, you have to do your job, right? And the time for feelings is, is later. But I, what I don't think we do a good job of is, like I was saying, creating the space for those later feelings. I've seen it in the volunteer fire service in, and in EMS as well, where it's someone's first or second call and they have to be told, like, I need you to go sit in the ambulance because this is just, it's maybe not going to work because they're having a reaction that just is not conducive to helping the patient. But what we don't do a good job of and what I was saying before about maybe that leader just creating a space maybe after a call is for that vulnerability and to take that to guard down, like you said. But what I think happens is we have that guard up during a call of like emotions are hitting me, but they're bouncing off because I don't have time. And then we don't maybe recognize when to take that guard down. We go home with that guard up. We maybe are in our marriages with our guard up. We're not able to be vulnerable with our spouse. We are, we parent with that guard up so we don't emotionally connect with our children in maybe the ways we want to. And so I think it all comes back to something called emotional intelligence and knowing yourself, being able to name the feelings that you're having, to be able to know what it feels like when your guard is up, in what situations you feel safe enough and comfortable enough to take your guard down. And then what it feels like when your guard is down. I think people equate vulnerability to weakness or vulnerability means if I want to be vulnerable and say that call was really hard for me, that means I can't do my job. And that's just not at all true. Brene Brown is the literal scholar on talking about vulnerability. I and mean, she talks about it way more eloquently than I ever could. But being vulnerable 
in the right times is I think the biggest indicator of an emotionally intelligent, well-regulated, strong person. We just don't look at it that way. We don't teach it that way. And the emergency services is just not set up for that. But we can change that. We can change that in little small ways. Powerful. Beautiful. Is there any thoughts on how you could reframe that word vulnerability to be more acceptable to the fire service? That's a great question. I'm currently trying to figure out another way to talk about coping skills. I think that word is super, that term is just maybe overused and I'm just trying to figure out another way to do it. I have a bunch of talks coming up and I, it's similar to that of people have reactions when they hear the word vulnerable. So maybe it's, I'm just thinking in the moment, maybe it's being emotionally available, emotionally responsive, something like that. But a part of what we, what I do at On the Job and Off Now, last year, we officially started an additional facet of what we offer to first responders called FRAP, our first responder assistance program. And FRAP is our online courses integrated into a therapeutic process with clinicians that I train to understand the ins and outs of the emergency services. So we have counselors that are trauma trained, they're licensed, they're all the things, but they are specifically trained to work with fire, EMS, dispatch, law enforcement, corrections, and a couple other things in there. And the biggest thing that having this available for first responders, what it does is it allows them to see what being emotionally available looks like in a safe way. You're not going to be made fun of. You're not going to be judged. And so I think once you can do that, you could see like, oh, the ground did not open up and swallow me whole when I talked about feeling X, Y, Z way. I think it then becomes easier to replicate it, whether it's at work or at home. Beautiful. So there's two powerful emotions that you talk about in your book after trauma, and that would be shame and guilt. Huge emotions that I know a lot of people experience on a daily basis. What would be your thought on self-compassion and how we could turn the table a bit on shame and guilt and how to get out of that that mindset. Any thoughts there? Freeing ourselves from shame and guilt is quite literally everything when it comes to trauma recovery or being more, I'm going to call it emotionally available now instead of vulnerable because <laughs> I like that term that I just came up with. But Trademark. as Trademark. I was saying, yeah, for real, you heard it here first. As I was saying before, I think there is so much power in not dismissing what we're feeling and not judging what we're feeling. And that is in keeping with shame and guilt. There was a time where I beat myself up every single day for not knowing better, for not knowing that all of these people are going to hurt me, for walking into the firehouse where I was eventually going to experience the attempted gang rape as if I was supposed to know that was going to happen. But I think when it comes to either interpersonal violence like that or even experiencing trauma on the job, for some reason, we think that we should have been able to predict it and therefore prevent it. I've had first responders say, I shouldn't have gone on that call that day. And it's like, how are you supposed to know? It's like in hindsight, we want to have missed something because then we can put our blame somewhere and therefore we can pretend if we miss something, then we're not going to miss it the next time. And therefore, we're always going to be safe. But I have... Like I said before, no regrets and no judgment on how 16-year-old Allie dealt with trauma, 18-year-old, 21-year-old Allie, because that is a, a simple waste of energy. It's just a waste of energy. It doesn't help me at all. And so I think a big part of freeing ourselves from shame and guilt is, as they say in the recovery community, just practicing radical acceptance. Radical acceptance. What happened? You made the choices you made. You are where you are. Now that we're decided on that, now we can move forward. And that's what really helped me. And I wrote about, I felt like there was some prophecy that I missed. There was some big red flashing light that don't go in that firehouse because you're going to get hurt. And I just missed it somehow. But the freedom was in forgiving myself for not seeing it coming and realizing that I didn't miss anything. I'm not responsible for what happened to me. And that is true for both what happened to me or responding to a call that ends up being a really difficult one to get over. There's just no point. It doesn't help us to be guilty. How does blame play into this? Is there, I imagine that's an emotion that's probably not healthy for us either, right? Is to blame. So does that play into it's, it? Or? It's not healthy, but it's incredibly natural and normal. So again, it's like one of those don't judge it types of things. I used to blame myself 
because that was easier than being mad at this entire system that was never set up to protect me you know, in my firehouse, that was never set up for me. It was not set up for me as a 16-year-old girl. It wasn't set up to work for me. And so I used to blame myself because that was easier. I knew where to find me. And that happens a lot with sexual violence is you put a lot of blame right here on your shoulders. But nowadays, I'm very clear on where the blame belongs and it's not with me. And there's a lot of freedom in that empowerment piece. I used to think that the people who hurt me were responsible for making me better. And that's just being stuck in victimhood because it's been 18 years and there's been no acknowledgement or anything. But what I found was I'm not responsible for what happened to me, but I am responsible for my recovery. And so the people that hurt me, it will always be their fault. It will always be their fault. I didn't hurt myself. People made those choices to hurt me. But I've forgiven them in the only context of, and I talked about this in After Trauma, I dropped the end of the rope that connects me to them. They're not a part of my story anymore. They're just not. So I certainly blame them for what happened, but I don't spend energy on that anymore. I've dropped the rope. And thinking maybe child abuse cases that I've helped on as a crisis counselor, thinking about maybe a first responder, the responders who were involved in those and seeing little kids hurt and how absolutely traumatic that can be for us where the blame belongs in those situations. It's on the people who hurt the child. But I've seen responders say, like I said, I shouldn't have gotten that call or I shouldn't have whatever. We want to put blame where it's more accessible. And I think it is normal and natural and we shouldn't judge it. But we, when we're ready I think it's important to also cut that rope as well because holding on to emotions like that are only detrimental for us in the long term. That other person doesn't care if you're mad at them or not. Well, that's a great visual to drop the rope and let that be history and drag you down with that anchor exactly. that's attached to that rope, right? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Move forward free. Beautiful. Beautiful. So in your book, you also talk about the community of healing, having a healing community. What, who is your community that helped you? That's a great question. It has certainly grown exponentially since I was a young firefighter. I belong to so many, just making it as wide as possible, international organizations like Women in Fire, which is just this organization of women and men and non-binary folks that love the fire service or love the emergency services in general. And Women and I've served on the board for them for a long time. There are conferences every year that are both independent and also located with FDIC in Indianapolis. And what people say is those are their favorite conferences of the year. Those are their favorite trips because they don't have to explain their experience to anyone there. Mm. You don't have to justify it. Like we all just get it. And so there's such a peace and relief in that. I have a close group of a handful of women firefighters who are either chiefs or who have been in it for a long time. And we can just check in with each other, be there for each other. There are unique challenges that come with being a woman in leadership. That's just how it is. And so we can support each other there. And then bringing it back down smaller, I have a fantastic husband who supports me in every way imaginable that I need. And even in the ways that I don't know, I need a great close group, close knit group of friends who have been my friends for a long time. So they've seen me through a lot of the recovery and the after and fantastic. I call them colleagues. I don't see them in person or work with them, whether it's in on the job and off or the nonprofit that I started, First Responders Care, to teach first responders how to better recognize signs of child abuse. There's those folks as well. Yeah, I'm very lucky to have cultivated such a group of support. And as it goes with our support groups, like you go to different people for different things, right? Like I know if I um struggling in this way, I'm going to go to my best friend, Hannah, because she's a therapist and she's really good at X, Y, Z. So I think that's important too, of having like non-work and work support. So you can get a break one way or the other. What would be your thoughts on any listeners today on how to build that community? Is that something that you got to go out and seek that support? Or what would you suggest for people who don't have a strong community right now and need that support? Yeah, I would say there is a community for every person. There's a community for every person. One of the one of my favorite ways to find a community in all the new places where we live, we're getting ready for a move to the south at some point this year. And I've already looked up women's cycling groups. I like to mountain bike and ride and there's a cycling group like everywhere. And so that's a way for me if that's a community right there. The Air Force community, the job that my husband does is pretty specific. And so the spouses in that group, we have a pretty unique experience as a military spouse. And so 
it's been, I've been really intentional about keeping in touch with all those different spouses, sending them Starbucks gift cards when they're having a bad day or whatever it is. It does take effort to build a community, but that effort will be reciprocated if you find the right one. So I think it's maybe about if you don't have a community, I think it's about maybe finding an activity that you like or that you're interested in and finding other people who may be like that. There are like reading groups where you just, you get together and you read. Book clubs are awesome. I've been a part of of a lot of that. So it's not super, super social, but you get to read and then come and have a shared experience together. Especially with the internet these days, you can find a group for any shared interest that you could have. Yeah, I guess it doesn't have to be a fire service group. It could be maybe the healthiest thing is to have something that's outside of the fire service. That's what I think often is getting a break from that. It's needed and so important to have people that you can speak the same language with and that that aren't always asking a million questions about your job because they do the same job. But I also think it's really important for first responders to have a break from emergencies and other people's stories of emergencies. I think, yeah, having a non-emergency service support group is really important too. Kind of going back to that in my own personal story, I had tons of hobbies before becoming a fire chief and all those hobbies just dissolved into thin air as soon as I became the fire chief. So those hobbies were my support group because if I went fly fishing, I was going fly fishing with three or four other people. Yes. And that all just disappeared as soon as, and that was all my fault because I didn't put the care and the attention into sure. myself. So it's a lesson and that I learned. super common. It's super and, common. And I think I love that you brought up hobbies because I think talk a lot about non-productive hobbies, like a hobby that you can't monetize, hobby that is productive enough, but also of no great consequence. And my favorite one that I've developed over like the last year is scrapbooking. Like on a large scale, who cares? But for me, I take so many pictures. I love creating a scrapbook for every year of my husband's and I's marriage, which is seven years and I'm very behind, but I love doing it. There's no stress. I don't allow myself to feel like, okay, I got to get this page done. Like it is a time for me to force myself to be really present. And at the end of it, I have a cool scrapbook that like our kids will be able to look at someday, but it's not life or death. And I think that's very good for our brains. Yeah, so true. Congratulations, seven years. Thank you. So as an expert in trauma from personal experience and also your education, what are some signs that firefighters could look for in themselves to go, maybe I do have something that's bothering me, weighing me down. What would be some of your key messages that you would send out? Sure. I think the first important distinction, and I teach on this every single talk I do, even if it's just one slide, it's, I think it's critical for us to understand the difference between post-traumatic stress symptoms and post-traumatic stress disorder. They are not the same. And I have first responders that will contact me and say, I ran a really bad call yesterday. I had a nightmare last night. I have post-traumatic stress disorder. And I say, good news. You do not have post-traumatic stress disorder. And chances are you are not going to develop it. And here's how you can help yourself. And here's how we we can help. And so post-traumatic stress symptoms are things that we have all felt, usually in like the 24 to 48 hours after a critical call. So a traumatic call, by the way, is simply one that overwhelms our ability to cope with it. And my traumatic calls and your traumatic calls are not going to be the same. A critical call is one that takes a lot of time or energy or resources or maybe has fatalities or a lot of fatalities or is an MCI or something like that. So after a critical call, which could be like to just a small group of people that ran it, or it could be community-wide, we might be feeling things like that call is really, really present in our minds. Like we were hungry when the call came in. Now it's done and we are not hungry at all. Our appetite is gone. And all we're thinking about is Did I get dressed fast enough? Did XYZ drive the engine there fast enough? Did I do the right things in the right order? We're just trying to process the call and make sense of it. That night, we might have trouble sleeping. We might not fall asleep very well. We might not sleep well. We might have some dreams about what happened. And that is just our subconscious mind, our unconscious mind, trying to do the work that maybe we weren't letting it do when we were awake. So dreams and even nightmares are actually they're good because it tells us where we need to maybe be doing some work. So if there's like a sight or a, a sound or something, that's where we can start to do some of the work. But usually what happens most of the time is even if we had like a rough night sleeping, we wake up on that second day, we feel a little bit more like ourselves. Maybe we're a little bit hungry. We feel like doing what we, you know, we're going to do. And as we move away from that call, 
we start to get back to where our baseline was. This is what happens most of the time for most people. Within the first week after a call, we expect most of those symptoms to dissipate. That's what usually happens. If we notice in ourselves or in someone else, we're two weeks out from a call, we're three weeks out from that call, maybe you feel like that call isn't really present in your mind anymore. You remember it, but it's not like popping up at all. But you notice so and they're not, they don't seem like themselves. They're not their jokey self. They seem really preoccupied. And it's three weeks out from a call. You know that they're approaching that one month mark. And that one month mark after a traumatic incident is when a post-traumatic stress disorder diagnosis could be warranted if done correctly by a mental health professional. We don't want to be self-diagnosing. But I know for a lot of first responders, they think, oh, a month, that's fun. I've been bothered by this call for five years or 15 years. Rarely is someone sitting in front of a therapist on day 31, although we try to do that with our first responder assistance program. So the short version of it is if you feel like there is something bothering you from a call, even if you can't pinpoint what it is, even if you wouldn't be able to say it was this moment or this sound or this smell, but it's you just it's bothering you. You never feel like you fully process it. That's your answer. But yes, maybe for whatever reason, your brain did not get to do the thing that it usually does where it takes that memory out of the front of your brain and processes it. So it goes in the back of your brain where it's not very present. For whatever reason, again, we're not judging it. We're just accepting. I feel that this call bothered me. Great. We can work with that. We can help. So really that first day to two days, post-traumatic stress symptoms could be happening. And in that first like day to week, there's so much that we can do to help ourselves. I have this acronym, BUYERS, that I have like magnets and posters that stands. It's like, to what do I do in that first day? People will be like, okay, I know Allie told me to do something, but I don't remember what it is. So that's why I made magnet because it's on your fridge in the station. So FIRES, if I can remember it off the top, fire, the F stands for first acknowledge. We're acknowledging to ourselves, this call was a doozy. Whatever that means for you, this call was extra hard, potentially. The I stands for initiate resources. Maybe you had a specific experience on the call in like a confined space where one person is going inside. They're having a very different experience than everyone else on the outside. Maybe they need something extra. Maybe that is a therapist or a trip away with a friend or whatever it is. Initiate a resources. R is respond to what you need. Do you need time away from the firehouse? For volunteers, I say it is okay to not respond to every single call. I know we like to. I certainly do. But it's okay to not, especially if you're feeling a little bit, for whatever reason, wobbly after a call. F-I-R-E. E is, I don't remember, but S is spend time away, which again, sometimes we need permission to do that. And whether that's like taking a day off, a shift off, whatever it is, that can be really helpful to just reset and give us some time away from that environment. And I also just say, don't panic. If you had a really bad call and your brain doesn't feel great, don't panic. There's so much that we can do. Oh, the E is expend stressful energy. So whether oh, that's, that's you know, that's a good one. we have to complete our stress cycles, all of those stress emotions that we feel that help us do our job, we have to get those out of our body. So sometimes that's exercising, that's journaling. I have a psychologist friend who tells first responders to drink a lot of water because you know how those stress chemicals get out of your body. You pee them out. So hydrate. Yep. So it's things like that you can really do that help to help yourself. You don't have to just sit in those feelings. There's action that you can take. That's awesome. The FIRES acronym is perfect because I, I truly think, especially the E, like spending energy is, our yes. body is energy. And when we're stressed, it, holds it, energy. it just holds it. And what does it cause? Cause more stress, cause body aches, ailments. Who Everything. Knows? Everything. And as you said, in your experience, you... We're really guarded. And we know that's an appropriate response sometimes when we're doing our job. But what that being guarded does is we're bottling up and we're pushing down and we're burying those emotions that we're having, which again is necessary sometimes when we are working. But what I always encourage people to try to do is to reset that at the end of every day. And I know that is best case scenario. We come home to kids in school and relationships and all of that. But our mental health 
is not something that we can afford to just be passive about or it's not this luxury that we can pay attention to whenever we want to because what happens is we never pay attention to it and then it explodes in some way or it becomes so unmanageable that other areas in our life are suffering. And I have two things that I do almost every single day to help me reset and to help me just have a very steady foundation, like a very steady emotional foundation. The first thing that I do, you could maybe guess by the two books I've written, is I write every single day. Just today, I started back. journal number 112. Wow. This whole shelf are full journals. So writing every day allows me to really be my best self on the page. I can write through past experiences, things upcoming, think about feelings that I have about it. And it's really a safe space that exists just for me to help process things. And the other thing that I do that I just started this year that annoyingly works as well as the internet says it will is cold showering. I hate being cold. The idea of doing like a polar bear plunge is unstoppable to me. But I wanted to try some of these new trends that are out there to see if any of them work. So I can talk about them from firsthand experience. And I'm telling you, the positive results were shocking. Shockingly I was so cold. annoyed. Shock, <laughs> shockingly cold. I was so annoyed that it worked so well because then, then I had to keep doing it. But right. it's 30 to 90 seconds of cold showering. And I do like the end of my normal shower. And it, it does a lot to your body physically. But what you are forced to do is control your breathing, because if you don't, you will pass out from the shock of it. And I certainly first like almost hyperventilated the first time I did it. But that state that your body is forced into when you're forced to be completely present, that sets you up in a positive way for the rest of the day. I know it sounds annoying. Who wants to cold shower? But I'm telling you, I saw such positive benefits. So I would highly recommend it. Yes, I've heard a lot. I've tried it myself as well. I wouldn't say it's a routine for myself, but I tried it and I definitely can feel the benefits of it for sure. Yes. Uh, so same. my goal is to make it a routine for sure. Yes. Any other tips on what firefighters could do for self-care to take care of their own mental well-being? Is there any things that you would highly recommend? I think it's just to take your mental health seriously. Pay attention to it. Stop thinking of your mental health as this luxury, indulgent way to spend your time. Like I said, I'm in grad school now and literally every day of every class is spent, if I had to boil it down, learning the havoc that stress and trauma wreak on our bodies and our minds and our relationships and our ability to regulate long term. So maybe things that happen to us when we're kids, we can't control those things. We can't control a lot of things that happen to us. But what we do have a choice over, what we always have a choice over is how we carry those moments and what we choose to do with them. So if you ran a crap call, you didn't ask for that. You didn't want that. You had the good luck or bad luck of being the one to run that call on that day. And I see people spend time being mad about that. They're mad at the universe. They're mad at God. Why did I have to be the one? And there's some meaning that you could find in that. But again, it's that radical acceptance of this happened. It's bothering me. Done wasting energy on why is it bothering me? It shouldn't be. And just saying, I want to take care of myself in this moment. I want to take better care of myself in this moment. And I really think it's as simple as like a lens shift in our mind of how we think about our mental health and how we think about self-care. Self-care doesn't cost anything. It might if you're having a therapeutic experience or seeing a counselor, but self-care isn't like Expensive massages and expensive, I don't know, skin care. Yeah, Those things can be nice, but self-care really means just to get to know yourself better, to understand your emotional range, what makes you feel a certain way, what types of calls might be specifically hard for you, and to be proactive about what you need. One of the last questions I ask in crisis debriefings is, what are you going to do after this? Where are you going? What are your plans? Because if I'm there, it's been a bad day. It's been a bad day. And so we're maybe in a better place in the moment because we just spent an hour talking about our feelings and not invalidating ourselves and, and what happened. But what are you doing after this? 
And sometimes people are like, I was supposed to go here, which I really didn't want to do. But I'm not doing that anymore. I'm instead going to go home and take out with my wife. I'm like, perfect. But it's giving yourself permission to put your mental health first. That's what I think self-care is. Beautiful. So since joining the fire service when you're 16 till today, what's what would you say is the number one lesson that you've learned in this whole journey that's made you a better alley? Well, I love that question. Gosh. I think including both actual literal firefighting and working as an EMT and being with people in those moments to standing on big stages in front of audiences of first responders and talking about everything that we've talked about. I think the biggest lesson that I had is to never underestimate just the power of your presence. As first responders, we want to have the right tool or the right skill or the right whatever to help people. And sometimes none of those things matter or can help. And it's just being with someone. And I think I've seen that too when it comes to walking with first responders on their trauma recovery journey. I've worked as a sexual assault counselor and domestic violence counselor in domestic violence shelters and hospitals. And in those moments, like you can't undo what just happened to that person. You can't undo the bad call you went on. I think it's to never underestimate just the power of your presence and the gift that just being present with someone can have. So powerful. Yes. So powerful. In your book, After Trauma, what what really resonated with you? What piece of that book really resonated with you that you'd like to share? My favorite part of that book are the stories that I shared that are not mine. I think that's my favorite part of the story is that my book could be a platform for other people's. We have Frank Lieb, who is the chief officer in the FDNY, has experiences on 9-11. We have individuals who survived a mass shooting or domestic violence as a child. One of my favorite stories is the story of Kelly Heron, who was from Seattle. She was training for a marathon, went out on her usual training run, stopped at this like state park bathroom to go to the bathroom and like warm her hands up because it was March and it was raining and freezing. And in that bathroom stall in the women's bathroom was this man who was already a convicted sex offender who was waiting, in his words, for a woman to, quote, rape. And so he attacked her in that bathroom and she fought for her absolute life and got away and got him sent to jail where he eventually died. And I wrote after trauma over the course of a decade and Kelly's story was in there and was growing and evolving for a couple of years before the book was finished and went to print. And in that time, and this is all documented in the book, I got to watch Kelly's relationship to her story change. And she got to the point where she doesn't want to tell her story anymore. She doesn't want to be known as that girl anymore. She just wants to run because she wants to, not because everyone at every race is expecting her to talk about what happened to her. And she told me in our like our final interview that for now and for the foreseeable future, this is the only place, this is the final place where she wants her story to exist. And the title of that chapter, it's chapter six, it says your relationship to your story will change over time. And that's a good thing. And that's a beautiful thing. And so that's one of my favorite parts is just to watch that evolution of her over a couple of years through that chapter. So yeah, that's my favorite part of the book. Yeah. I think it, it your trauma does not define who you are, right? Is that how? Right. You, yeah. Absolutely. And I've been telling my story for a long time. The facts never will change. The events will never change. What happened to me will never change. But how I talk about it, the meaning that I've made from it, the lessons that I've pulled from it, that will change. And that's okay. I've seen people who are public figures who talk about some something hard that happened to them where like they themselves have evolved, how they relate to their story has evolved, but they think that they always have to be talking about it in the same way that they can't ever have grown. And so there's a lot of like dissonance in that. And to the point of the chapter, and you see this beautifully in Kelly's story, is just like how you feel about what happened to you is going to change. And that's okay. And that's not something we have to resist. That's a part of the healing. So concluding here, Ali, it's been a, an amazing conversation. I really think that your story, your wisdom, your passion for helping the fire service really resonates with a lot of people. And I know this episode will definitely, once again, resonate with the listeners and really change a lot of lives, I think. So really appreciate Thank that. You. Thank you for this opportunity. It's one of my greatest joys is to be able to talk about what happened to me truly, because I think every time I talk about it, it proves that the trauma wasn't the end. And yeah, it's just, I'm very grateful to have opportunities like this. Yeah. And, and look at where you've come to where you're developed these companies and these not-for-profits and 
that is simply incredible that you're supporting that service that maybe did injure you six, 18 years ago. Yeah, it certainly did. But there's healing in that too. And every time I train someone how to maybe recognize signs of child abuse, in whatever context that means, it's like, oh, maybe for the child abuse that does happen in firehouses, because it does, we can maybe help people better be able to recognize that. So there's so much triumph in the work that I do, whether that's helping first responders with mental health or whatever it is. Very grateful to be living this beautiful life that I've constructed. Yes. Yeah, and gratitude is probably the number one self-healer. If you can be gratitude and feel gratitude every moment or every day at least. There's always something. There's, There's always, always something. Yeah. Always something to be yes. grateful for. When close, what would be your final message to our listeners today that you would love to just share and get out there to the world? I would say spend at least five minutes with just yourself. Mm. No podcasts, no music, no TV shows on in the background, no social media in front of you. We're scrolling five minutes with just yourself and see what feelings live there because that will provide you a foundation to get to know yourself better. And that is what matters. 100%. Fantastic. Ali, any new projects or new books coming out or anything you want to share with the audience? Lots, but nothing I can share publicly yet. Okay, great. So more to come from Ali. Lots Ronsla. more to come. Yes, awesome. That's right. Once Thank again, you. Thank you so much. And I uh, really appreciate you sharing your story with us today and your vulnerability and your openness and your authenticness. I really appreciate it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to Beneath the Helmet. We hope that this podcast has provided you with valuable insights into the world of firefighters' health and wellness. Remember, caring for your physical, mental, and spiritual well-being is crucial to achieving optimal performance. Join us next time on Beneath the Helmet for more inspiring conversations. Until then, stay well.